Yeah, my name is Emanuel Bloch. I'm one of the scientific directors uh, here at the Institute, uh, leading the Quantum uh, Many Body Systems Division here at MPQ. So in our experiments we control individual atoms that we trap in fields of light, in crystals of light, how we call it, optical lattices. So these are created by overlapping different laser beams on top of each other. And this creates like a microscopic grid of light traps in which we can trap individual atoms just floating in free space, uh, held in the vacuum chambers, just held by these light fields. Lasers are the way for us to trap, to control the atoms. That's how we basically get the handle over manipulating the atoms, how we make them observe them, how we can move them around. And so that's basically uh, why you can find easily 10 to 15 lasers in our, in our experiments that all have to run at the same time, precisely controlled to have the right frequency, the right intensity, so they can interact with the atoms in the exactly right way that we want. We're working at extremely low temperatures, I would say the coldest temperatures in the universe, a billionth of a degree Kelvin above absolute zero. At those temperatures, the atoms are almost at a standstill. They are just moving with millimeters per second around, whereas at room temperature, they move at hundreds of meters per second. We use a laser light to cool the atoms, so we point laser beams onto the atoms. And this laser beam is like a wind for these atoms, and if we shine the wind from all six directions, then we can slow them down in all directions and make them basically come to a standstill. And only when you go to these extremely low temperatures, you get new collective behavior of these particles, and the atoms, imagine, they are trapped in this laser grid, as we said, and now we really, basically what we do is we make them light up, uh, we make them fluoresce, and we collect that light with a very good uh, microscope objective that allows us to resolve the position of the individual atoms in this uh, grid of laser light. So we can really take photos where in the end we see the position of each individual atom in the system. Okay, so here we see our laser set up. This is what we use for laser cooling of our lithium atoms in this experiment. So all these blue boxes are basically lasers that generate the light to cool the atoms, to trap the atoms, to manipulate the atoms. And all the optics that you can see actually on the table is needed to prepare the light beams, these hundreds of mirrors and uh, polarization controllers, intensity controllers, prepare the light. And then this light is guided through these optical fibers actually to the experimental table that you can see over here, where the actual experiment happens. Okay, so here we actually see the heart of the experiment. So this is the vacuum chamber. You can see back there, you can see the glass cell, which uh, the atoms are held in, and where all the laser beams enter from all sides to trap the atoms in this part. So that's this glass cell back there, and all the fibers that generated the light over here transport the light to this table over here. Uh, so this is where the action happens. And here we're coming to the actual control center of the experiment where Sarah is, for example, currently programming our timing system to how the sequence of lasers, where they turn on and off. And then there's here the picture of individual atoms trapped in this laser grid. So you can really see how they arrange in this regular fashion. And each bright spot is just a single atom that we see in the experiment. And Dominic's already evaluating the data, so he's already looking what, what, what kind of parameters we should change maybe in the next run of the experiment and seeing how we should organize things in online evaluation of the data. If they would be just individual particles, it would be a bit boring, actually. It's like with humans, right? I mean, some, when people get together, it gets more interesting. And so this is also the uh, case for the atoms. We try to engineer interactions in these systems. So we set the rules of the game, basically. How do these particles interact? Uh, that the rules, and then we look what's the outcome of the game in the end. So, you know, what do they do then? And that's what's so exciting because very often we don't even know what we're going to see, what we're going to find then. When we 
we started, I would have never imagined that we can take these fantastic photos of individual atoms there. So that was really something we developed over the years that we did not envisage at the beginning when we started out. So that's great because this field is full of surprises and what you can see, what you can detect, what you can probe. And I think it's going to be like that also for the next 10 years down the road. The phenomena we're interested in are um, phenomena from material science, condensed matter physics mostly, how do materials behave, but they also actually, and that's interesting for us as scientists, they also connect to a broader range of uh, phenomena in physics and natural sciences in general, so from high energy physics to statistical physics across different energy scales, uh, temperature scales, um, length scales, you find again and again uh, similar phenomena and uh, what we try to do in physics is to understand how all of these are related to each other, what are the truly common laws that govern this kind of behavior in all these vastly different systems. And we, we never know what we can, uh, what we're going to discover. And sometimes you see phenomena where you know, basically you're the first person in the world to see this. And uh, so that's a very exciting moment, of course, to see that. Yeah, I know, it must be that's why I so an L, so a lip, name, so that it's so like an L then runter geht, where it's draufsteht, where it's here reinfährst and then dann runter. For now, it's a mostly a fundamental science-oriented field, but there are people in material sciences, for example, Bosch is very interested in looking at these materials also because they want to apply them, you know, new battery technology, uh, new materials they want to employ to design sensors. One thing, for example, in a material that's important to know is the resistivity for electrical currents. What's the resistance of the material? And basically what you want to see, you know, if you set the particles into motion, the electrons, uh, how quickly are they damped, uh, basically, that they don't move anymore. That's what resistance in the end is about. And so by now taking photos, we can really see this in reality. We can directly track the motion of the atoms in this material and see how they slow down. We want to push into this field of quantum computing also, where we basically use a very similar arrangement. We have this grid of atoms, which would represent the qubits in your system, and you can control these qubits with the laser beams, and you can have them interact in a controlled way. These are the basic ingredients that you need for a quantum computer. We work with quantum simulators in the group. Uh, they are quite advanced, with one of the, some of the most advanced quantum simulators in the world in the group to also do calculations or simulations that basically already in many cases uh, are beyond the capabilities of, of classical computations. Well, I started out in the uh, University of Bonn and uh, there basically most people were doing high energy physics, nuclear physics, uh, and I did my first student intern actually also at, at CERN in Geneva. Uh, and that was exciting, but I also f learned that that was not an experiment that was for me because all these big scale, huge experiments, it was like too many people involved. I wanted to do experiments in a smaller group of people. And that was also the time when uh, Bose-Einstein condensation was invented. So, you know, how to cool down these particles to low temperatures and do experiments with them. So I got very excited about this and started, said that this is a field I really want to work in. And that's how I started basically my career in the field. Uh, this scientific freedom or creative freedom that Max Planck Society offers me and the group is, is fantastic. We try to have very flat hierarchies. It's not like our path is set in stone, you know, for the next five years. But it's a very interactive process where everybody, the voice of everybody is heard in the discussion and we sit down together and we think together what we want to do next, which direction we want to explore. And I think that's, that's really the big benefit we have here, of course supported by the fantastic infrastructure of the whole institute. I think this kind of infrastructure you have in very few places and that's of course, uh, as a researcher, maybe most fantastic place where you can end up. In.